Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict 2012 Academic Webinar Series. My name is Jake Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Content Development Associate at ICNC. And today's webinar is titled Anatomy of an Occupation, Did the Planners of Occupy Wall Street Really Have a Plan? And will be presented by Nathan Schneider, editor of Waging Nonviolence. Nathan Schneider is an editor of Waging Nonviolence, a website of news and analysis on struggles for justice and peace around the world. Beginning in July and August of 2011, he was the first journalist to be allowed to cover the planning of what would become the Occupy movement. He has since written about it for Harper's, The New York Times, The Nation, The Boston Review, Truthout, Yes Magazine, The Catholic Worker, and more. He has also contributed to two of Occupy Wall Street's print publications, the Occupied Wall Street Journal and the title, Occupy Theory, Occupy Strategy. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Nathan Schneider. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, it's really uh, a privilege to be able to talk about this in this, in this uh, space, in this context, uh, and really fitting, actually, because... For me, in a lot of ways, the story began in a setting very much like this uh, at the uh, Fletcher Summer Institute uh, hosted by, by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict uh, over the summer. Um, I had spent the spring, as a lot of us had, uh, watching very closely what was going on uh, in the Arab world, in Egypt, and Tunisia, and elsewhere. And, you know, I've been following every morning I'd wake up on and get on Twitter and turn on Al Jazeera and try to figure out just what was going on and, and try to write about it on Waging Nonviolence. Um, but there was something that I saw in that meeting uh, over the summer in, in Boston that was really striking, which was, um, you know, I saw something that wasn't really visible in any of the news reports about the movement, which was this kind of drama of planning and strategizing. You know, the, the, this uh, institute brings together uh, activists and scholars from around the world and uh, is an opportunity for them to, uh, to talk with each other, to, to compare ideas, to compare strategies, to think about how in their context um, their movements might work. And, um, and just, just meeting some of those people and hearing those conversations in particular, I saw a real drama there, something that a, a story uh, from the perspective of the journalist that wasn't being captured, that uh, wasn't on the news. Uh, uh, the, the, the journalists were just waiting for something to hit the streets, uh, but there was a really important part of the story that wasn't being told. So I came out of that, uh, out of that meeting in, in the summer uh, thinking about how I could uh, learn how to tell the stories of, of, that, of that process of planning and strategizing that goes into movements, and really that, that process of empowerment uh, against the sort of narrat narrative of determinism, where uh, movements are just caused by economic factors and you know, by Twitter or something like that. Uh, what I was seeing was, in fact, that um, to no small extent, movements were caused by people who, who thought about things and strategized and made decisions, and, um, and that those decisions really mattered. Now, already by that point, by the summer, something was in the air in the United States uh, and in the, in the world. Um, of course, there had been the Arab Spring um, uh, beginning in, in, uh, in January. And then by February, Madison was lighting up. And we had, uh, we had a, a, a reporter for Waging Nonviolence who was in there. Uh, he was actually the last reporter to stay there. Um, through the occupation and, and was tweeting to us the whole time, and we got some really uh, amazing insights there. Uh, then by May, Spain erupted in a kind of accidental ac occupation uh, that began with just a day of action and a small group of people who decided to stay. The whole country then lit up into an occupation movement. Um, uh, elsewhere around Europe as well, things were going on. On May 12th, uh, there was uh, a massive march on Wall Street wasn't reported very much, but it was uh, a, an important kind of uh, step for for a lot of organizers in New York, uh, people getting to know each other and really identifying Wall Street as the locus of the problem. 
Um, and then uh, there was also the presence of Anonymous, which, which is this group of international uh, uh, hackers and other uh, online activists and, and kind of pranksters that had been, over the past year or so, been undergoing a process of politicization, going from uh, a group of mostly uh, pranksters to activists um, through their involvement in uh, efforts against Scientology, and then especially their involvement in setting up online networks uh, for the Arab Spring. Now, a group of, um, of Anans decided in the summer to launch uh, what they called Op ESR, Operation Empire State Rebellion, which again was an action targeting Wall Street. And actually, they planned to occupy Zuccotti Park, the very same place uh, that Occupy Wall Street would end up happening uh, on June 14th. And they did a lot of organizing online, hundreds of thousands of video views. They thought they really had some momentum. Um, and then the day, the day that it was supposed to begin, only 16 people showed up. So in some ways, that was um, evidence of the limitations of those kinds of networks. At the same time, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a step toward what would follow. Now, as soon as I got back from the, from the meeting in Boston, I started looking for a planning process to, to start covering. And uh, within a few weeks, I had more than I knew what to do with. Uh, the first that I learned about was the October 2011 movement, which was a group of older activists, mainly middle-aged. Uh, the youngest person in the group was 38, um, experienced people. Who were, uh, who were planning to occupy Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C., uh, an extended occupation that would last as long as it needed to, uh, and it was timed for the anniversary of the beginning of the Afghanistan war. And so I started going to, to their meetings um, just to see how their process was going and, and how they were planning this incredibly ambitious uh, action. And it was at one of those meetings that I first learned about the call from Adbusters Magazine, a sort of art and activism magazine um, uh, for, for Occupy Wall Street. They just said, Occupy Wall Street uh, uh, on, on September 17th. They, they uh, uh, made the call with this poster that was such a compelling image of a ballerina on the Statue of the Charging Bull, which is near Wall Street. And, um, uh, and, and there were just some rumors that somebody was was planning this, and that uh, you know, Adbusters didn't offer any plan, only a call. Um, and uh, and so then I started looking for the people who were involved in that, um, and that brought me to uh, what became my first uh, meeting of uh, my first planning meeting for Occupy Wall Street. Uh, mine was the first one I went to was August 13th. The first uh, meeting at all was actually at that uh, bowl. Uh, on August 2nd. And the picture there is, is an image from that first meeting. Um, uh, and, and you see everybody's looking at the camera. Uh, that's not me who's taking the picture. Uh, that's somebody who was asked not to take pictures. There were people who were concerned not to have their picture taken. But it really captured the kind of like intensity and also a sort of paranoia in that group. No one really knew each other. A uh, few groups of people knew each other, but, but there was a lot, of, a lot to work out in that group. Um, people had been drawn by the call online and were, uh, in many cases, meeting for the first time. There, the group was really international. There were people from Greece and Spain and Brazil, um, and uh, they were very much speaking from their experience and their movements, um, and the whole discussion was being informed by that from the very beginning. Um, and the process was really quite chaotic um, at first glance, and uh, especially compared to the to the careful, more kind of mature reflection that was happening in the October 2011 group. Um, uh, this group was you know, really uh, uh, wrestling with a lot of challenges and, and, um, and didn't seem to have a whole lot of clarity. Uh, over time, these discussions in both the October 2011 group and in the Occupy Wall Street group um, started evolving. Both of them began with this idea of, of hitting the ground with a demand, kind of the Tahrir model. I, I mean, in some ways, that's mythologized, but, but there was this sense that the activists in Tahrir Square 
uh, and the, the marchers and the Egyptian people went there to oust their president, and they stayed, and then he left. Um, and uh, you know, and that, that with that in mind, kind of adbusters uh, put with their call um, the the words, "What is our one demand?" So they had this idea that that everybody would get together and uh, and and they'd hit the ground with one clear demand, and they'd stay until they won it. Um, in the course of these meetings, that, that idea of one demand was very exciting to people, but nobody, to, to a lot of people at least, um, not everybody, um, but nobody really could agree on what that demand could possibly be. People would hand around proposals and you know, they'd say, we need to uh, end the wars or end the Fed or, or uh, introduce a financial transaction tax. But none of these things were really something that everybody could agree on, especially in the kind of consensus-based um, model of, of, of discussion that had been introduced. Um, and so those discussions really didn't go anywhere. Um, now, in the, in the October 6th group, the, the discussion went a different way. They had started formulating lists of demands. They had a 13-point uh, set of demands. Um, but then later in the discussions, during a weekend uh, a retreat, they started rethinking that approach. And especially, th this especially came from um, a discussion they had had uh, that was based on the work of Gene Sharp, where they did a power analysis and tried to figure out what they as a group actually were capable of and what uh, needed to happen in order to undermine the, um, the powers that they're um, interested in threatening. And um, what they found was uh, was that they really didn't have the capacity to inflict the sanctions um, that would be necessary to to exact their demands, um, and so they decided uh, that the priority really should be movement building rather than uh, showdown. That the purpose of the occupation would be to attract um, to to attract more people, to radicalize more people, to um, begin a shift in conversation that would lead toward an ongoing movement. Um, it, so in both cases, and, and that sort of thinking kind of became the default uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the Occupy Wall Street planning meetings as well. It was, I think, a little less conscious and a little more of a kind of negotiation among, um, it, was, it was kind of more like a, a, a it was, more like a, a Ouija board, you know. It, it, the the discussion was moving kind of based on the collective um, sense of people who were having arguments that that weren't really getting resolved. And what came out of it was interestingly so similar to the very um, uh, careful reflection that was being done in the October 2011 movement. Both of them decided that their goal would not be to hit the ground with demands already in place but to start a conversation and use that conversation as the basis um, of building a movement. So the model kind of switched from Tahrir, and this is you know, drawing pretty broad strokes, but um, from Tahrir to Madrid, you know, where, the, where the model became not just, not just mobilizing in one place and making one demand, but um, mobilizing people across the country Calling people, calling on people everywhere to build assemblies, to create networks, and to uh, mobilize for the future. Now, the media reports still. There were a few reports coming out in the weeks leading up to September 17th, in August and September. Um, none of them seemed to reflect this at all. Um, of course, because none of the reporters were at these meetings. There were a few, uh, you know, anonymous and other groups were putting out information about Occupy Wall Street, and all of the reports were based on that, but none of it really reflected what, how these discussions were really unfolding. So um, it, in a lot of ways, they were caught off guard. The media was caught off guard when it actually hit the ground, because in those planning meetings, um, things had changed so much from the original call. Now, when um, September 17 finally came, um, Adbusters had called for 20,000 people to occupy Wall Street. Uh, that day, uh, uh, based on all the independent media hype, the, the Twitter uh, discussions and, and, uh, and, and 
you know, lots of organizing through social media, only 2,000 people showed up. So still better than, um, than June 14th, but um, still far short of what Adbusters had hoped. And so the day was pretty much, uh, it, it began as a sort of um, depressing rally in a lot of ways. I mean, there, were, there was a lot of excitement, but there was also a, a sense of frustration that what a lot of people hoped for hadn't happened. Um, now, the tactical committee from the General Assembly that had been planning this um, set up some contingency plans. You know, they were, they were very careful about, about what they wanted to do that day. Um, publicly, they called for, uh, after a rally at noon, a General Assembly at a place called Chase Manhattan Plaza, uh, which is an open space um, in, uh, under a big office building uh, just a couple north, blocks north of Wall Street. And so that was the publicized uh, location where probably the occupation would begin. Now, the night before, that had been totally barricaded off by the NYPD. Um, but fortunately, the, the, um, the tactical committee had arranged a number of, of, um, of alterna alternative locations and had printed up uh, sheets that they handed out at the last minute just before uh, the group was about to move. And then they called out the um, the place that they had decided would be the most uh, the most likely location where they could uh, move the group and start the assembly and perhaps even start the occupation. And uh, that was Zuccotti Park. Now I had been to these planning meetings. Um, I had only in passing heard of this place. Um, nobody had really been talking about it. So it was a very quiet decision uh, to 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 move there. And it actually. In some, uh, at some points involved people who'd been uh, involved in the June 14th occupation, um, uh, who'd come to the, this group through Bloombergville and earlier uh, another occupation in New York City in the summer that had lasted three weeks. Um, one of the choices that they made in the last uh, planning meeting before the occupation began was that they would have no police negotiators. So, um, no one was telling the police what the plan would be. No one was even telling the police, uh, trying to mislead the police about what the plan would be. Uh, but the idea was that individuals could talk to police uh, all they wanted, but nobody could represent the group to the police. Nobody could negotiate on behalf of the group to the police. Some people felt that this was a really irresponsible decision. Um, but in some ways, it turned out to be really effective because uh, it ensured that the police were always guessing um, almost as much as everybody else, um, and that they were unable to uh, predict what would happen on that first day and then afterwards. And, and this continued in the early weeks of the movement um, as a series of, of complicated, um, unpredictable actions uh, by, the, by, the, by marchers, uh, by Occupy Wall Street marchers, ended up bringing on sort of overreaction from the NYPD that resulted in pepper spraying and then mass arrests in chaotic situations that were caught on tape um, and that really helped to grow the movement and to show the kind of unpreparedness of, of, um, of the, of the uh, police for, uh, for what people were doing. Um, I mean, another thing that's so important to, this, to, to the success of this movement, I think, uh, and to the, the, you know, the initial excitement that it created was the, the power of art within it. Uh, I mean, so many of the people who were involved in the early planning and, and the organizing were themselves artists, uh, art students, professional artists, um, uh, people you know, kind of with the heart of an artist. Um, and, and that sort of sense of unpredictability, of creativity that always infused um, life on the occupied plaza. Um, and, and you see here on the on the far right, the bat signal over the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, uh, that was on the march of uh, November 17th, a big, one of the biggest uh, marches in the movement so far. Uh, when when uh, nine, We Are the 99% was projected on the side of the big building as people marched across the Brooklyn Bridge, that was, nobody knew that was coming almost. And it was incredibly exciting for the people who were there. Um, and uh, and one of these one of these moments that really captured people's imaginations. Um, now, what surprised me um, in the in the in the early weeks, especially by 
uh, October 1st, was the extent to which the plan that uh, and the hope that people had had in, uh, in Tompkins Square Park during the planning meetings for Occupy Wall Street um, really, really took place. It really worked. It really happened. Uh, assemblies spread all over the country uh, in cities and towns all over the place, and I've had the opportunity to visit some of them um, in places from uh, New York and Washington and Oakland to uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, and and uh, uh, Fresno, California. Uh, these occupations have been everywhere, and um, and so again, rather than calling for one demand in one place, you have occupations all over the country that are linked by a sort of cultural connection, but which are focusing on the issues that matter to them in their play, in their in their um, in their areas as they connect to uh, the problems of Wall Street and the one percent. So, um, in that sense, if you judge the action by by what was actually hoped for by the people who planned it, it was an incredible success um, and continues to be, uh, even if it didn't end up um, making the one demand that Adbusters called for. It also was a success. As many people, as many of us have realized, in changing the national conversation. I mean, for first time in as long as most of us can remember, inequality was in the discussion. Uh, you know, I have a picture here of, of Obama mentioning it at the State of the Union address, um, uh, referring to inequality, to wealth inequality, as the defining issue of our time. But just throughout. Uh, the, the media now, there's more and more discussion and awareness that inequality and, um, and corporate power and government and all these issues that were raised by the movement um, really should be addressed and talked about and thought about. Um, and that's a major difference. And this is a movement uh, I, I didn't mention earlier. I mean, a week before uh, this hit the ground, in a meeting, uh, it was announced that $800 had been raised. Now that got up to closer to 2,000 um, by the time it actually hit the ground. But the, the the tiny amount of money that was involved in making this happen um, just stands in such stark contrast to the the tremendous amount of money that is going into the political discourse um, at the political at the electoral level right now. Now, of course. Uh, into the as winter approached, especially in November, there was a wave of um, evictions that spread throughout the movement. As uh, as police, in uh, coordination through the Department of Homeland Security, um, swept through the country, swept through the occupations, and um, cleared most of them out forcibly. And uh, this was a for for many of us who were there for those experiences. This was an incredibly um, painful and kind of traumatic experience for, for people, but um, in many cases, it also um, uh, it also gave birth to a kind of new direction for the movement, and that's the direction that things have been going ever since, which is a transition from uh, from uh, it's a strategic and a cultural transition from short-term tactics uh, that is the occupation to long-term strategy, and um, so it was a it was an ambivalent experience because on the one hand um, there was this there was this sadness and this frustration this sense of loss um, uh, with the with the loss of the occupations on the other hand um, th there was a sense that uh, this could be the start of a new beginning. So I'm going to move now into um, giving more of a sense not of how this movement uh, came to be but where it is looking now and uh, what it's up to. Um, the Occupy movement is generally out of the news, and you, you get the sense that um, a lot of people who, um, who, who uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of people we hear from in the media um, say that it's over, and you know, they can't really be blamed for doing so if they follow the usual journalistic practice of only paying attention to social movements when they hit the ground and take your attention, rather than paying attention again to this process of strategizing and planning and reflecting and organizing that is really the lifeblood of these movements and what makes them work. Um, 
the meetings these days in the Occupy movement, especially in Occupy Wall Street, where I spend um, do most of my reporting, um, are incredibly exciting. Um, it's hard to describe them any other way. Um, there's there are so many talented people involved, so so much being brought to the table, um, far more than could be said for the meetings that led to this hitting the um, scene in the first place. I mean that the, the, the meetings for the plan for October 17th had at 100 people at most. Now there are dozens and dozens of meetings with that number of people um, and far more um, talented, well-connected activists and um, also organizations that are starting to gradually radicalize and learn how to participate in this movement. And that includes labor unions, um, political organizations, um, and others who have some stake in the issues that, um, that the Occupy movement is raising. I have a picture here of Inner Occupy, a kind of logo of Inner Occupy, which is a conference call network that arose in, in the fall. And um, now every day there are lots and lots of national, international conference calls on various topics related to organizing in the movement. And this is a sign that, that an incredible amount of coordination is now beginning to happen uh, on a national level. Things aren't just being talked about in local general assemblies, but they're being talked about nationally. And, um, and every action that you see now in the movement um, shows up in, in as many, uh, as many um, cities and towns as the, as the um, movements can muster it. Um, so you know, there was a day of action on February 29th. I think 70 cities participated. Um, so so uh, uh, also, this is happening on the citywide level. In New York City, um, there, there's um, mobilization now toward, um, toward days of action that connect all of the different assemblies that have started up across the city in different neighborhoods. There are little assemblies meeting, addressing local issues, and they're learning to work together and to organize. So um, the movement is really, you know, it's much quieter right now, but it's really deepening its roots. Then also there's, um, there's a, a new consciousness of campaigns that's developing. And I think this is really important. Again, this goes from tactics to strategy and thinking in longer terms. Um, uh, one of these is, uh, is the uh, widespread anti-foreclosure actions which are taking place in a number of different cities and in a number of different ways that can include uh, reoccupying foreclosed homes and, um, and uh, uh, disrupting uh, uh, auctions of foreclosed homes and so forth. And these sorts of actions are starting up and they're also participating in larger strategies. One of them that's underway and that's actually um, reported on in, in Waging Nonviolence today is an effort to actually try to um, force the breakup of Bank of America, the largest bank in the country, with the idea that this bank is in trouble and is going to require a bailout soon and that the movement should try to push it into crisis and force the and and through a public education campaign force the government to do something other than simply um, keep this too big to pale bank going and to find a way to force a restructuring of the financial system. Uh, another issue is student debt. There's been a lot of effort to to organize um, uh, student debt strikes, um, and then also there's an effort like um, Occupy the Courts. Uh, organized by a group called Move to Amend, which is a pre-existing political organization, which has uh, really kind of um, put its energy into supporting the Occupy movement um, in, in, in order to bring about its goal of, of ending corporate personhood and um, creating a situation where meaningful campaign finance reform can happen. Um, and so they've organized National Days of Action, and, and um, this is an example of an existing group, an existing network, which is and pu putting its energy into supporting the Occupy movement and in turn um, leading an orchestrated campaign to, um, to, to win its goals um, in concert with the movement. Um, alongside the campaigns, um, what's being discussed now are massive days of action. And you know, I think these are, these are dangerous in some sense because they can be so draining and um, you know, if you just take the streets for one day you know, it's not so clear what will be accomplished. You know, the power of the occupation was that it 
took public space, it put bodies in the way of uh, public space and it didn't leave. Um, so, so, so the ways that, that these days of action are being thought about is, um, I, I think at best, creating a counter narrative um, through the sequence of these days of actions, creating a narrative of escalation. Um, and this is especially a counter narrative to the, uh, to the, the primary narrative in the news this year, which is the election cycle. And so the real challenge for the movement in these days of action and in this counter narrative um, linked by campaigns is to create a, an, an alternative narrative that actually can offer more tangible hope to people than these presidential campaigns, which are uh, this year spending more money uh, than the world has ever seen. So it's the least occupied election in history, and, um, and the movement really has a challenge in trying to create a contrast to that that, that um, will be, that will be um, effective. Now, one of the big days coming up, uh, especially in New York and on the West Coast, is May Day. Um, there's been a broad coalition built among occupiers and also um, uh, unions to organize that. Um, and then also, uh, there's been a lot of attention towards Chicago uh, in mid-May when there was <laughs> was to be uh, meetings of both NATO and the G8, um, though the G8 meeting has since been moved to Camp David, um, clearly in response to the, to the um, threat of massive protests. So, um, you know, it, it's still a question right now how the movement is going to respond to, the, to, the, um, to that change, uh, but for now, they've declared victory that the threat of their presence has um, caused the powers that be to change their plans. In conclusion, I just want to underscore this sense that, that understanding this movement, and I think any movement, is, um, requires understanding how it plans. Um, if you looked at what's happening on the streets right now, you'd think just about nothing was happening in the Occupy movement, um, because pretty much all that's happening uh, in a lot of places are planning meetings. Um, but uh, as I've argued, I think there's more happening now than there was on September 16th um, before a national movement was about to hit the streets and, and um, sweep up the, 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 uh, uh, the media's imagination for a couple of months. So uh, I don't know if that counts as nothing. Um, it's also important to recognize how the media was so uh, unable to understand what was happening in the early uh, days and weeks of Occupy Wall Street because they were relying so much on the internet because they hadn't been uh, there hadn't been enough reporting uh, you know on how this process was evolving and so nobody really understood what was going on and it took a few weeks um, uh, to get there um, but I think it's also interesting to think about the extent to which um, Things were not minutely, minutely planned, um, in which room was left for improvisation and discovery. And I saw this especially in the contrast between the October 6th, the 2000, October 2011 um, planning for um, Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C., and then the planning for Occupy Wall Street. Um, in, in the former, in, in the plans for Freedom Plaza, they were much more detailed, much more worked out, much more mature, uh, much more structured. Um, but there was something about it that didn't quite capture the imagination in the same way and didn't seem quite so capable of responding to, to um, challenges and controversies. Um, there was something about the way that the planners of Occupy Wall Street, at least at that point in the movement, at that, for that initial moment um, before the campaigns got underway and everything else, um, that, that leaving some things unplanned really also had value and, and uh, enabled the, the movement to become flexible and to grow and to involve more people. So um, that's the conclusion of, of this presentation and I really look forward to discussing it with you and hearing from you about um, your thoughts and experiences. Thanks, Nathan, so much uh, for your presentation. Um, so as, as Nathan mentioned, at this point, we can go ahead with the question and answer session. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Nathan, that you kind of covered in the middle of your presentation um, was that now that physical occupation has always kind of been a central 
part of the movement. And now that people are kind of moving away from actually occupying space, how do you think that the movement will be able to keep uh, maintaining its momentum? Well, I think that uh, the, the first part of that answer are the, the uh, efforts around campaigns and days of action that I, that I talked about. I think that's, that's part of it. But there's also a tremendous amount of interest um, among organizers to, um, to reoccupy space of some sort um, as, as, um, as kind of organizing centers for the movement. Um, people really miss the, the, the experience of just going to the, to the plaza or the park and, and getting to know other people and, and the, the kinds of just surprises that, that would happen there um, were the lifeblood of the movement and people really look for that again. And in New York, every couple of weeks there's a, an, a kind of a, what they call a town square, which is where they just temporarily set up for an afternoon in some, in some park in the city and bring back all of the committees, the food and the library and everything um, so that people can experience uh, what it was like in the heyday. Um, and, uh, and I think there's interest in maybe taking next um, uh, or obtaining uh, indoor space, community centers, places that um, can be a, a base for organizing and for meeting um, uh, uh, that might be you know, less vulnerable and, and, um, and in some ways problematic than the parks. And it looks like we have one question already. Um, this comes, I, can't, I don't see a name here. It says, thanks for the presentation. The Occupy movement has one demand. It is the wrong demand targeted at the wrong audience. The demand is the occupation. People hate occupation. People love liberation. The movement thus has the plan. The plan is to fail. Uh, let, let me know when you'd like to learn strategic planning from better campaigners from Ukraine. Uh, so do you have any responses to that, Nathan? Well, I, I think uh, you know, just I don't, I don't know where this question is coming from, but I think you know one, one issue that comes up a lot in the movement is that of global solidarity and, and um, a kind of recognition that um, we're all Thanks. working in different places and in different contexts and um, the situation in Ukraine might be different from the situation in the United States um, and, uh, and, and so to some degree I think the differences in sense of what should work and what should be done you know, might have to do with that. Um, but, but I think the, the uh, you know the question of failing is is on people's minds too, and and you know I, I think I saw the Twitter profile of somebody in one of the organizers I know in the movement the other day who said you know I try to make movements fail better, um, and that's you know that's one kind of attitude that's been inculcated after years of frustration in the American activist community. At the same time, I think what has what drove this movement to, to succeed to the extent that it already has, and this is just um, a few months into, uh, into an effort that, uh, that is incredibly ambitious, that, that, that asks for a profound restructuring of the economic system um, in, in ways that still are hard to imagine, uh, uh, is, is the sense that um, I think the difference that made this that made this possible was the sense that actually it could succeed, and that comes from having watched what happened in Egypt and Tunisia, um, and seeing that that large groups of people organized and mobilized and um, believing in their capacity for change actually can bring about change. Uh, so, so you know, to that extent, I think that this movement was made possible by the sense that that that. Um, by, by a sense of believing in, in, in its possibility from the beginning. Thanks, Nathan. And we have one question here from Darren, who asks, is there any fracturing within the larger Occupy movement based on varying philosophies or approaches to resistance and construction or lack thereof of movement? I'm referring specifically to the anarchism that has played a role so far. Yeah, there's definitely fracturing, um, uh, but uh, uh, 
in a sense, there's been fracturing all along. I mean, the, the movement kind of popped up in this rhizomatic structure where, where um, different occupations came up um, uh, in local contexts without consulting Occupy Wall Street. They just appeared. And um, so in one sense, uh, what's happening right now is far more interconnection and coordination than ever happened before. And in, that, in the process of that, of course, there's go going to be conflict. Um, uh, so the movement has kind of all, all, always already been fractured. Uh, it began that way, and it's becoming less so uh, to a tremendous extent. Um, lately, there have been debates about, um, about the role of anarchism in the movement, and especially diversity of tactics, and um, questions of the, the centrality of nonviolence. Um, we could get into those. That's a that's a long discussion that I've been very much involved in. Um, uh, but I think it's it's really important to recognize the extent to which, uh, especially in New York and Oakland, um, uh, anarchist ideas, but really throughout the movement, anarchist ideas have been central to to the organization and to the culture of the movement, and um, and to. Often, anarchists in the media now have been described as a kind of fringe group that's involved in that's kind of spoiling um, the, the stew. But that's, uh, I think, a real misrepresentation because um, in a lot of really central committees and and uh, groups in the movement and and at really important meetings, anarchists have had um, you know very respected voice and um, and have been really at the center of a lot of the discussions and have been. Um, uh, uh, have contributed to it enormously. Um, so I think this this sense that there's a um, there's kind of an outside agitator fringe that's coming in and spoiling everybody's fun is a misrepresentation. It, it may be true in some small cases um, and uh, and some cases that are really overblown uh, by the media. But but I think that the larger story is the extent to which um, there really is a conversation, an incredibly diverse conversation happening here where anarchists are working with Ron Paul supporters, are working with socialists, are working with people who haven't really been politicized in any um, clear way before. Good. That actually leads perfectly into our next question uh, from Cynthia, who has two parts. The first part is, do you think that Occupy created a long-term momentum problem for itself by starting off with protests as their primary tactic? And the second part is, what is your sense of the level of commitment to nonviolent discipline within Occupy? Um, the, the, in terms of the first question, I think there was definitely a problem um, in terms of uh, longevity that the, that the protests, or really the occupations, um, set out. I mean, an occupation in a large public space is hard to maintain. It's not especially sanitary or, or pleasant. Um, the Spanish, you know, ended in Madrid, ended their occupation voluntarily, and some people think that might have been a good idea um, uh, in the Occupy movement. But, um, I, but I think that's, you know, that's a challenge that has to be overcome, and I think it can be overcome. Um, uh, and, and and I think that's through thinking in more strategic terms. But I think there was value in um, in in starting that way and in hitting the ground running in that sense, in not beginning with a master strategy, um, but really beginning with a call for people to to rise up and to join and to participate. Most of all, um, because what's happened is that um, the the level of of organization and talent and capacity of people who are involved in the movement now is immeasurably greater than what was available before September 17th. So um, in that sense, I think that that beginning with the protest was incredibly valuable. A lot of activists, veteran activists I knew before Occupy Wall Street began, um, you know, I'd, I'd call them up and ask them, what do you think about this crazy idea? And they'd be like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to buy in. A few weeks later, all of those people were at the front lines in all the meetings, participating, offer, offering their skills and their um, background. And so, um, to that set, to that extent, I think that the, um, that 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 uh, approach really worked. Uh, but it, it raises challenges as well. Um, as far as nonviolent discipline, um, you know, it, it's it's a tough question. I mean, to to an extent, 
people who might be inclined toward violent insurrection or of some sort really made the decision uh, at the beginning that they wouldn't do that here, that this would be a nonviolent movement. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny that, that now the debate has come up um, uh, about whether this is a nonviolent movement months later um, after there really have been, you know, kind of tiny outbursts of, of anger and frustration, but, you know, n no group has really, no general assembly has talked about planning for violence, um, talked about, you know, planning to blow something up or, or to hurt anybody. I mean, that just isn't on the table. So the extent to which, you know, th this has been presented in the media as a debate about violence and nonviolence in the movement um, is really, in some respects, kind of absurd because nobody is really proposing that they go out and do violence. Um, on the other hand, I think the more interesting question is the depth of um, nonviolent culture and discipline and and um, and thinking in the movement. And that, um, th you know, that's kind of an open one. I mean, when you go to most Occupy protests, there's a lot of shouting, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of chaos. It kind of feels like it's on the edge of a riot sometimes. Um, and, uh, and, and so to me a question is, is the movement's culture going to move more in a direction of, um, you know, creating that stark contrast between the, the, the peace of the protesters and the violence of the state that's so important to effective nonviolent action, um, or whether things will continue to escalate. So that's, that's, um, that's a live question for me. But, um, but uh, you know, and, 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 and in the last few weeks, in response to this debate, I think the most productive responses have not been, you know, people articulating the necessity of nonviolence um, uh, through thick and thin, but actually those who've been focusing on responding creatively to the challenge and coming up with new creative actions in the streets, not talking about violence or nonviolence, but um, in the process coming up with, um, you know, fun, exciting um, ways of, of growing the movement um, by capturing people's imaginations, nonviolently. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that actually also segues into the next question from Spencer, who asks, what is your perspective regarding the relative effectiveness of violence and nonviolence? From Chenoweth and Stefan, 2011, Why Civil Resistance Works, I understand that any success of change efforts involve defections from the establishment, and those defections are much more likely with nonviolence than violence. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a total uh, partisan of of Chenoweth and Stefan and, and um, so much of the work that's come out of uh, ICNC and and um, and you know related discourses about uh, nonviolence and political movements. I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, but I think uh, what's also at stake in this question is how to think about cases where you know certain kinds of violence did play a role in movements that were successful. You know, you, a lot of times in the Occupy movement, people talk about Egypt, um, and, and that's taken as an example in these in these debates. You know, okay, this was largely a nonviolent movement, and you ask Egyptians, um, and the, you ask them whether the movement was nonviolent or violent. You know, one answer that one tends to hear that would be kind of surprising in the United States was, "Yeah, we w were completely nonviolent, and when the police attacked, we threw rocks and burned their police stations down." Um, so, so um, you know, the question is, okay, does that count as violence or does that, you know, count as justified uh, uh, self-defense that could be nonviolent? Um, I don't know. I think in the United States that those sort of standards are very different and burning down police stations would be unequivocally violent. Um, you know, but in the case of, uh, in the Egyptian case, somehow, um, you know, that sort of action was still perceived as being kind of essentially nonviolent. You know, so a lot of these discussions in the movement, you know, are about about how do we have solidarity with people who do things that that we wouldn't support, um, and and what's effective in this context, in this country, um, with this group of people that we're trying to mobilize. And there's no question in the movement um, that that overall, um, the the most effective way to mobilize Americans and make them want to join a movement for change is to do so nonviolently. All right. 
And uh, this next question is, it's I'm putting together two questions to save time from two different people. Um, has to do with the media and messaging. And the first part is, can you talk a little bit more about the effect the media, mostly negative, has on the Occupy movement and its ability to move forward? And the next question is from Mache, which says, in the polls published in December, Occupy movement received less support and more criticism than the Tea Party movement, quote unquote. This is an obvious failure in, in the right kind of messaging of, Occupy, of the Occupy movement. And what would you recommend Occupy Movement change in terms of how it communicates its message? Well, I think it's it's a complicated one. I mean, the the media is is a really interesting question in this movement. Um, you know, in the, in the planning process, um, you know, extensive preparations were made for creating their own media, for for doing uh, social media and uh, uh, streaming uh, uh, video online. Um, but there was really no preparation made for um, for handling the mainstream media, and that was in some ways parallel to the decision made not to have a police negotiator. Um, there was the the thinking was is that the, the mainstream media is um, owned by the by the one percent um, by the same powers that uh, have the stranglehold on politics, and so they wouldn't work with them. They wouldn't make compromises in order to to bend to um, uh, to that media. I think the media analysis in the movement is becoming more sophisticated. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the loss of, of support for the movement, um, uh, you know, it w was in some ways uh, due to a kind of failure of, of, of media messaging, you know, but in some ways was due to uh, a, a kind of natural ebb and flow and uh, and a vulnerability once the once the camps were down, the parks were out, um, that enabled uh, uh, the mainstream. Uh, you know, a lot of really big media outlets that had been looking for an opportunity to to attack the movement to do so and to really discredit it. Um, and, and that that happened on a lot of fronts. And then and in some cases, uh, the criticisms were were um, earned and valid. In some cases, they didn't make a whole lot of sense. In some cases, they just betray the kind of laziness of mainstream media in dealing with popular movements, you know, where, where every act of violence by the police on unarmed protesters is justified, uh, and, uh, and, you know, any uh, tiny attempt at self-defense or, or expression of anger in the process of being beaten is, is taken as, um, you know, as a, as a sign of, of failure and weakness and, um, uh, and and, uh, and criminality. Okay, um, our next question comes from Brian. Uh, Brian asks, is the movement concerned that the upcoming presidential elections in the U.S. could create distractions and pull the movement into small questions about simply tweaking the U.S. governing infrastructure? Are there plans this spring and summer to drive the Occupy discussion and action and prevent this detour? Yeah, there's huge concern about what effect the election will have. Um, you know, there there's a variety of perspectives in the movement on what role it should take. Um, I, I would say the the more central uh, uh, the the prevailing view is that is that um, the movement should not actively participate in the election, should not support any candidate, um, and uh, sh should try to set the national agenda itself rather than just follow um, the discussions that are happening in the um, in the elections. At the same time, there are a lot of others who feel like um, it's very important to make sure that one person or another wins in the uh, in the elections. And so, on some level, the movement's going to have to be involved. Um, and uh, you know, I think that that efforts like the the campaign to break up Bank of America, the campaign against student debt. Um, moving to amend the Constitution in order to prevent the kind of excessive uh, uh, spending that's happening in campaign cycles. Uh, you know, these are all things that are not really on the radar of the, of the electoral uh, political scene. You know, these are things that the movement is introducing. Um, the movement is insisting that people pay attention to. And, um, and, and so I think, you know, the success that, that you're, or the, the 
the, the, this question will be answered by the extent of the success of these kinds of campaigns as well as the major days of action. If they're really able to convince people that there's a politics that's more interesting and more meaningful to them than, um, than uh, the politics offered by the candidates, then uh, you know, the movement will start seeing some real growth and, and start uh, you know, building toward the point where it can inflict some real sanctions on the system. Great, thanks then. Uh, the next question comes from Ethan, who asks, one of the questions that has been raised in different ways during the course of the Occupy movement is to what extent the movement is racially diverse and incorporates the vision and leadership of communities of color. How would you say this has been addressed in the months since the movement began, and how is the more diffuse, changed nature of the movement able to speak to the needs of communities of color? That's a great question. It's really, really important to a lot of people who are um, central in organizing and who are taking part, um, um, more and more of whom are people of color um, and who are finding ways into, uh, into this movement. It was um, fairly diverse from the beginning, but still you know, overrepresented with this kind of um, white, educated, um, you know, just out of college, um, strapped with student debt um, uh, demographic. And I think um, the call of the movement, um, as more and more people have been realizing, was not simply to get more people from, say, the Bronx to come down to, um, to Wall Street and occupy Zuccotti Park with them. The call was to occupy your place, occupy um, wherever you are and focus on the issues that matter to you. So rather than wait for the movement to, to address those issues, you know, raise them for yourselves and the movement as a whole will stand in support. Um, now, of course, I issues that are important to, uh, especially the urban poor, have been, you know, intensively raised um, throughout. Uh, stop and frisk in New York has been really important. Police brutality also in Oakland um, has been vitally important to those efforts. Um, but, but I think, you know, in a lot of ways, what the movement is calling for is for is for for different communities, whoever they are, you know, whether they're they're African Americans in the Bronx or, or um, Chinese Americans in Chinatown, just a few blocks above, you know, to to speak for themselves because um, the people in this, the, the organizers themselves, recognize their limits, recognize that they can't speak for the, those communities. They don't understand the issues well enough, and to the extent that that's happened, um, uh, you know, there's been an incredible sense of gratitude that I've seen talking with organizers in communities of color who have been fighting for these kinds of issues for years and are given a big push both in support and funding and momentum um, by the existence of the Occupy movement, by the sense that there is a kind of framework for them to take part in um, that, they can, that they can join into. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I'll try and combine them as best I can. Uh, the next question is a uh, synthesis from Michael and Hannah. Um, Michael asks, if you can please compare the effectiveness of direct, dem direct democracy planning structures versus the spokes council or representative model of planning and organization. And to go along with that, Hannah asks, have you seen much confusion between the concept of non-hierarchical leadership and a leader leaderless movement? And how do you think the theory of direct action translates into this practice? Um, oh, those, these are such complicated questions. Um, you know, first of all, I, I, I would, from my point of view, I, th I think that um, just on technical and the spokes council is um, and should be uh, a part of a direct democracy uh, structure. That that it's it shouldn't be um, a representative structure. Uh, if it becomes that, it's it's um, it's got problems. I mean, it's the the idea behind the spokes council is that small groups um, that are able to function in directly democratic ways through consensus are able to coordinate through the through the spokes council and align their decisions together um, without making decisions that um, that participants aren't agreeing with. So so it it should be different from a from a representative model. Um, uh, in terms of horizontality and, and uh, 
uh, leaderlessness. I think these these things can get really thorny. I think what I'd really like to emphasize in this case um, is you know the challenge that this movement is facing in terms of its structure. I mean, it's uh, choice to really emphasize the process and the direct democracy was, I think, incredibly powerful for those who participated, even while it was bewildering to the outside world often, um, because it provided such a such a clear and and um, uh, uh, and, and striking uh, contrast to the kinds of political discourse that we've been having for so long, where it invited people to speak not for a party or for a candidate, but for themselves, and so talking about that in relation to direct action uh, is dead on. I mean, this was an incredibly powerful direct action that brought people in. And um, I just saw again and again over the course of months people falling in love with this movement through this experience. Um, now the question is, is, you know, what role does this have in the movement going forward? And what's really interesting now is that the power structure is shifting so that um, rather than uh, control over funding and organizing hap um, uh, happening in the, in, the, in the General Assemblies, it's moving kind of outward to affinity groups um, and, uh, and project groups that are operating kind of within the movement but, but aren't necessarily participating in the, in the old uh, structure of assemblies and working groups. So um, things are getting very complicated and I think there's a real question about um, what kind of structure does an organization need to have in order to call itself part of the movement? And in some sense, I think that's an unanswered question. What kinds of uh, features and, and internal culture um, uh, make something a part of the movement as opposed to not? And you know, should internal structure decide whether one is part of the movement or simply the goals that, that a group sets for itself? For instance, you know, an, an action like the Tar Stands action, which uh, has so far been able to halt the construction of a pipeline um, uh, in through the United States and Canada by direct action um, has in some ways kind of participated in the Occupy movement, but it was organized very much from the top down with a lot of discipline and structure and um, you know leadership um, and uh, you know and so there's a question about whether an action like that, which was very effective. Um, uh, can really be thought of in terms of this movement and how the movement should relate to, to actions and groups like that. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more. Uh, this is coming from Nada. I think it's appropriate to wrap it up. She was actually a webinar presenter last year on uh, Bahrain. Um, and there's, this is two parts. Um, the first part is, could you please tell a bit more about the story behind choosing the We Are the 99% as the motto for the movement you know, who came up with it and, and when it sort of became popular. And the second part is more towards towards you, Nathan. Uh, being a reporter yourself, how do you maintain your objectivity while you attend and sympathize with the movement and its demands? And what challenges do you face in your reporting in terms of objectivity? Um, great questions, and thank you very much, Nada. Um, Nada was also, um, you know, at meeting that we went, and meeting her was really a part of what inspired me to do this work in the first place. So um, I really appreciate this the question. Um, in terms of the 99%, uh, it was being floated uh, from the first planning meeting on August 2nd um, by some people who were involved. Uh, it, it, it was actually, th that idea of 99% has been floating for years. There's a documentary that was based on that idea a few years ago. Um, uh, the, the attempt to occupy uh, Zuccotti Park on June 14th, organized by Anonymous, was actually organized by a subgroup called A99, um, referring to that 99% idea. Um, and it's unclear whether the organizers with Occupy um, you know, came up with it kind of on their own independently or were drawing directly on, on these predecessors. But this idea of a 99% and 1% has been kind of circulating um, and was very much in the air. Um, it, it really took off through the efforts of, uh, of a guy named Chris, who also started the food committee, who um, created a website on Tumblr called We Are the 99%, um, that invited people to share their stories. So, in a lot of ways, what made the, the, the slogan take off was, um, you know, was that website and the fact that it was so participatory and that people were getting involved in it um, around the country. And then, from the first day, from the first marches, the chant was 
we are the 99% along with Occupy Wall Street all day, all week. And, um, and then I would, as I went around the country and saw other occupations, that was always the, the favorite chance. So that, that idea uh, just stuck and really captured people's imaginations. Nobody needed to enforce it. Uh, it just happened. In terms of my own experience as a journalist, this has been a real challenge. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a friend of mine who's a more experienced journalist, older than, than I am, you know, has been on lots and lots of news shows. He usually, he and I both um, have done a lot of work on religion in the past, and um, he's often taken very strong positions against, you know, conservative religious forces in this country on, in public uh, shows. You know, there's no question where his position is, and that's totally okay, he says. But if he gets on one of those shows and um, seems to support the movement that he's reporting on, that's seen as suspect. It's, it's a kind of odd double standard. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've had to really think about this a lot. I've been confronted a lot by older journalists about my role, especially if I was sleeping in the park and going to meetings and participating in just in the sense of, like, you know, helping out if something needed to be done, um, you know, things that one does when one is, is, is working among uh, other people. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had, to, I've had to make certain decisions about, you know, where I'm not going to get involved. Um, mostly not to keep some sort of pretended objectivity in the eyes of, uh, of, 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 in the standards of the kind of mainstream media, but more to keep the objectivity that seems really important to me. For instance, if I'm reporting on a, a particular working group's um, business at a given point, I'm not going to jump into the conversation and, and express my opinion too much or take sides too much on, you know, on, on a certain question because that would, you know, and that has sometimes, you know, the potential to get me into trouble and make it hard for me to report on the different perspectives in a debate. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of forced me to think about, you know, where, what kind of access I need to tell the stories that I, that, that I really want to be able to tell um, and what sorts of distance I need to create in order to make, you know, my, my role very clear and to and to also make, help make people comfort comfortable with me, and I think that a lot of the the reason that um, that mainstream media has been so bad about about covering um, protest movements in, in some sense is related to the um, standards of objectivity that they propose. I think that having some sense of objectivity as a reporter is really important, but I also think that the kinds of objectivity and the kinds of choices one needs to make when covering social movements um, are very different from the kinds of ob objectivity that one has when covering presidential elections. Um, uh, and, and the problem is that most of our media is trained for the latter, and uh, when they apply it to the former, they don't know what they're doing, and they're not there for the most important for when the most important decisions are being made, um, and for really uh, the chance to understand how power works within the movement. Good. Uh, thanks so much, Nathan. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. Um, Nathan, are there any closing remarks or any specific lessons you, from the successes and failures of the Occupy movement you'd like to highlight? Um, oh, there are so many lessons. I mean, one thing that has been so um, that, that that has become a rule of thumb for me is never make predictions. Never think you really understand what's going on in this because. Um, in so many cases, um, I found myself surprised and forced to revise, um, you know, suggestions I've made and, and things like that. So I think, um, you know, for me, the, the, the thing that's most important to, uh, to emphasize, the lesson for me, is to listen to what's going on um, as closely as one can, to, to, to see what's really happening and be careful about um, the capacity of, of our theoretical frames, our sense of history, uh, and so forth, to um, prevent us from understand, understanding what's happening uh, in an unfolding uh, new uh, dynamic movement. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, everyone, so much for logging in to listen. And as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded. Um, it will be uploaded to our website in the next few days. So feel free to go to nonviolent-conflict.org, 
once it's posted and listen to any parts you may have missed or even recommend it to some other people to listen to. And we'll also upload um, Nathan's PowerPoint slides to the website. And there, if you do visit the page, you'll see there's about four articles that Nathan has published on Occupy that you can go ahead and read and download. So we recommend you go do that. And we'll be sure to keep you up to date for the next webinar, which will be coming in the next week or two. So keep an eye out uh, for emails from us. And Nathan, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And thanks for taking the time to be here today. Thank you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you to all who came. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon.